Okay. Sweet. We're rolling. Sorry about your shoe. It's okay. You know, I wasn't anticipating there being a 200 and something inch deer down here to when I threw my foot down. So this, uh, for guys watching the YouTube version of our podcast, this is Kimbo. I'm showing him on the camera right now. This is the first time that we've told this story. From behind is when that deer's so wicked. Uh, I'm pretty sure it's wicked at any angle. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm i going to be honest with you. I really like him as a Euro mount. Like, I, 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 I mean, I know I that's crazy. I can't but say that that's bad. Um, but he stands, like, if you put him on a table like this, he stands up perfectly, just like that. So it's hard to not, I don't know. I'll have him as a Euro mount until he's ready to, I have the cape downstairs, but until he's ready to, like, be put on the wall, I'll have him as a Euro mount for a while, but I have him down low, and Kendall just uh, stuck his shoe. I think a G2 went through his nice leather shoe. <laughs> uh, can you hear me okay? I can't really. Yeah, I can hear you okay. fine. All right. Well, as long as you can, I'm good. Can you not hear yourself? I hear myself talk all the time, so I'm good. Yeah, no, I hear you fine. Right. Appreciate you coming from work to help get this done. Yeah, no, I. it's been hard to cram it in. I know Drew's been all over the place, too, and – Trying to get us uh, together has been uh, it's hard. Like, it's the middle of hunting season. I mean, it's like, okay, uh, I have some free time. Guess where I'm going to be? Yeah. In the tree. Getting us three together, especially this time of year, is like herding cats. Yeah. Uh, I was just telling our buddy that because uh, he was wanting us all to get together uh, yeah. soon. So. so this is definitely like long overdue for telling this story. But I was trying to get it to where like you were here and Drew was here. Right. And I was even trying to get Jay like – Jay just I think he just had I think he just killed one yesterday. Yeah. Yeah, he just shot a super nice buck. Yeah. Yesterday. So I was going to have him on it too, but hey, you haven't heard the story. No. Um I've gotten bits and pieces of it. So okay. I'm looking forward well, to this the is, full story. This is me unpacking it for the first time. And for those listening, uh we are working on the episode. It's it's a year's worth of footage and right now uh Forrest is working on a timeline. And he sent me a couple, uh, just like clips to sort of give feedback on. And yeah. it's right now he has a he's shaved it down to two hours on the timeline. So to to work back from that, I mean it's it's probably going to be an hour episode, and it's still not even going to tell a fraction of of really what all happened. And that's why I like the podcast format so much yeah. is that like we can actually dig in a little deeper, and and get you know, into the nitty gritty details that you don't right. really get to see in a, in a YouTube episode. Yeah. Because a lot of times, like, I mean, people, people think like, um, like for example, the, the Tennessee video we put out, like people were upset that, uh, you know, we didn't show much of like the cops being there and like the game warden and all that stuff. But it's like, we didn't film that. I'm, I'm not, and I'm also not going to people's doors, knocking on their door for retrieval permission for, like, you know, holding a camera. And yeah, filming it's already it's awkward enough these days to go knock on somebody's door, and then all of a sudden you show up and you're doing this. Like yeah. Maybe, so like a, lot maybe of a little it, odd. Yeah, a lot of, like, for example, that stuff, like, wasn't filmed. Right. So that's why we said, like, go to the podcast to hear the full story. It was like a lot, it's, it's hard to a lot of times give all of the details in a video because, like, for example, this, this deer, Kimbo, I mean, I, it, it, over a year, and it's like there's stuff unfolding all the time, and it's like I, a lot of times I don't have a camera with me. So, you know, a lot of the details get missed, or um, sometimes we try to, like, refilm something to sort of, like, add in some of the, the context to certain things That's just right. to try to still tell to the story tell the as story. best we can. Yep. But it's so hard to capture, like, all of the details on camera as things are happening because a lot of times we just – it, things happen on very unpredictably. Yeah, I mean, so, it's... <clears throat> but we want to take our time with this episode to make sure that it's that it gives this deer justice, like that it tells the full story, shows the effort, uh, because this deer deserves it. And so that's why, you know, sometimes it takes a longer time to edit our episodes. Like we want to... It's not like we just want the episode to be good. It's like we also want it to... Tell the whole story. Yeah, and respect that deer yeah. as fully as possible because if you don't show all of the backstory and effort and stuff, um, you know, it just it it gets perceived differently. So like that's why 
you know, our, sometimes our editing takes forever to do is because there's just so much footage. Well, it's also the quality of, of our production, too, is, is part of it. Yeah. And so, you know, like you said, a deer of this caliber, you want it to be the full story. Yeah. I also just did a podcast with uh, Tyler Jordan, Jordan, and probably uh, if you haven't heard that one, I would go listen to it because I get it really personal, and I've, I've sort of hit a place where I feel like I've pushed the urban game as far as you can possibly push it. And you'll hear why when I tell you this story, but I just have, we've always dr- known that deer like that exist out there. Right. And it's like, I feel like that's what I've been chasing for like going to all these different States, like to just find a deer of that, just like out of this world caliber that a true once in a lifetime deer. Yeah. And that we're looking at it. And so I just feel like I've sort of reached this place of like, okay, what's next and i th- i will never fully abandon the suburban stuff but i am looking for like I- i've always been addicted to the challenge sure well and i mean that's a huge part of why we hunt yeah i mean yeah that ch- that if if there was if there was not a um a, a a significant challenge none of this would interest me at all i just wouldn't care about it to be honest like if I love that challenge. So to me, I'm kind of looking at, okay, well, what's the next challenge? Right. I've kind of been like getting back to the beginnings of like what hunting meant, meant to me originally. I, I just spent a weekend at a buddy's farm where I like, I legitimately grew up hunting when I was like 14. And that was like an amazing trip down memory lane. I'm hunting home right now. Like I'm sleeping in my own bed. Like I'm hunting a spot I've had for seven or eight years. Like it's just I'm kind of like taking a step back for a minute, but looking into next year, I'm like, man, I, I, I want to challenge myself in different arenas. Yeah. And whether that's elk, elk, elk you know, elk. mule deer, like public land. I just, I'm, I'm looking to mix it up a little bit and, yeah. and, uh, you know, shift a little bit from just like just pounding the urban stuff. So, um, let's get into the, the story. Cause it's, it's a doozy. It's a lot. Um, I definitely know that I've been part of some of it. So, um, yeah, please do begin. So I was purposely trying to like hide details from you guys or just tell the full story for the podcast. Sure. So I found out about this deer, um, basically a year ago to the, almost to the day. I think today's November 3rd, right? Yes. Ballpark. Yeah. Um, I think almost a year to the day. I found out about this deer and, uh, we get leads all the time. Like, I don't, I don't really check DMS or, or, uh, messages specifically looking for leads, but that we get a lot of that stuff. People just like, Hey, I saw this huge deer, you know, blah, blah, blah. And the, the most difficult, like, that's a great thing. It's a huge advantage to just have a lot of eyeballs in a lot of places. That's that, that is what one of the major factors that separates us from, uh, you know, someone who like more of an average Joe, which is, he just doesn't have as many people out there sending messages of like putting feelers out there. But the double edged sword of that is, is we have chased so many leads that have been false. Right. Well, just like what Drew did yesterday. Literally it just happened yesterday. Drew got sent a picture of a guy, a a huge deer. And it was like a, a trusted friend. Who was like, you know, the the pastor of this church is like, uh, put a camera behind the church and and like this is the the picture of the buck and I looked at it and I was like, dude, I don't know, man, that's that looks a little suspicious and so he did like a somehow did a Google search where he like posted the image into Google and it like tracked it down to TikTok and he saw the videos like from some outfitter or something not real. I didn't even know you could do that. I didn't okay. either, <laughs> but you know, dr- you know, Drew's mind, and yeah. the wizard he is, so. Um, you know, there's constantly like the amount of wasted time on, on leads that happens is, is astronomical. Yeah. Even when I was looking for this deer, I had another lead <coughs> from a guy that was like on a work trip and I'm spending, you know, multiple, probably three days, uh, scouting, getting permission, things like that. Um, so I finally get permission, camera out, week goes by. I get a picture of the deer and it matches the description this guy gave me perfectly. And it's like 130 inch deer, which is a nice deer, but the deer was described to be a lot. Bigger. Uh, oh yeah. yeah. So it's like, you know, I 
spent several days chasing leads like that. So I guess what I'm the point I'm making is like it is an, a huge advantage to get sent leads, but how do you sort out what's real and what's not? Right. O so or what's I had a huge huge deer in my backyard. Yeah. Yeah. Right. What's huge? Like yeah. the body, the rack. Right. Yeah. We get so, sent stuff like that all yeah. the time, and like I I really don't look at it that much because I uh I don't know I I like getting spots and uh putting cameras out and just you know the the way we've kind of always done it but we are always like looking for that you know that lead that's that's real and stuff like that so right. that's that's how this deer came to be was I was on I never get on Facebook ever and I'm on Facebook one day and I see this like ping this message ping through and this guy was like hey I, I got a big buck lead call me I'm like no dude I'm not calling you <laughs> <laughs> you know we, we get who stuff are like, you yeah, yeah i don't know you like yeah. we get stuff sent that all, like that all the time a lot of times it's just people that are trying to just like get trying to get us to respond just to talk to us or something like that yeah and like i'd love to talk with you but if i sat there and responded to everything i would on social media like i wouldn't have a normal life right so it's just you know one of a, a, a mass amount of messages we get and somehow the next day bing like I s another message pops through and it's these pictures and i'm like it's one of those where you're like ah that that's probably <laughs> not real and this again this is like in november so this guy was like call me and he sent me these pictures and i was like the story seemed legit and all that stuff and i was like okay i'll you know i'll, I'll give the guy a call this year's pictures or was last it? year okay this is last okay. november so um I I, I I let me rephrase that so much has happened. A lot of the details make it shifted. I think the pictures or videos of this deer that he had were taken in November. I think okay. I saw them in maybe like December. By the way, it's November 3rd, so I don't even know what month it is right now. Um, so definitely last year's pictures. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> so um, I think I think it was December. And... Uh, so the, the pictures were like a, or video was like, pictures were like a month old or something anyways. So I talked to this guy and, uh, the story was that he was a, uh, prison guard. And he said that like one of his inmates had a friend of a friend or family member come in or something and like showed him these pictures that he was like a railroad worker or something like that. I, I don't know exactly what all the details were, but, uh, I guess maybe he overheard the conversation. It's, this it's, it's crazy. It's literally crazy. <laughs> He's like, maybe he or I think he ever heard the conversation or uh, maybe like in passing talk to this prisoner or whatever. And uh, so the prisoner was like, yeah, my cousin or friend or whoever, like apparently saw this huge deer and like he got pictures of it. And I think like the next time that that guy came in to maybe visit that prison prisoner or something, maybe the prison guard was there like and asked to see the pictures or something like that. And I don't really know how it all transpired, but that's kind of the story I was given and so anyways these pictures come through and that's that's how I ended up getting these pictures the only details I had was I knew what city it was because I've, I've been spending I spent three years there right and so I've got a I've built a pretty big network and grid of spots and all that kind of stuff and keeping tabs on a lot of information and whatnot so had you ever been in that area no before? okay <laughs> no 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 you don't want to go to this area <laughs> at all. I, I, I don't know. So <laughs> I, I will never push it to this limits ever again, ever. Yeah. Like, I don't care what, how big the deer is. This was this was a one-time pushing it to the limits thing, and I, I, w I will not put myself in that position again. So it's a part of town I never, ever went to. <clears throat> I found that out way later. But okay. at, the, at the time, I talked to this guy on the phone, and he told me the story and stuff. And he, the only information I had was it was by um, a grocery store, which there was, you know, 20 of these grocery stores all throughout this, spanning this massive entire city. Right. And it was by a railroad. That that was the only information I had. And so it was like I started dropping pins on Spartan Forge, and I'm like, Th there's 15 places this could be. <laughs> there's railroads and grocery yeah. stores everywhere. So I started making trips totally blind like just almost process of elimination yeah. of like okay this is literally the most vague information i have 
but this seems to be real. And the other thing too is like chasing leads or just marking spots and going and get we stumble into other deer. Oh yeah. So it's never wasted time, you know, getting spots because you may stumble and you never know what you might stumble into. So I spend a I spend uh a, a, a couple trips up there and keep in mind it's it's twenty hours round trip from my house to go up there. Um and that's not including like all the hours you spend driving around door knocking and stuff. So I made a couple trips up there, um, trying to get some spots and, you know, didn't, didn't have all that much luck. Definitely didn't find the deer and fast forward to we're at NWTF in Nashville for that event. We're at a, uh, like a, an event, like a post, uh, show event. Um, and they're having like a party. It was like at a, at a op- open bar kind of deal. And they had like a band playing. And one of my buddies walks up to me. He's like, man, you're not going to believe the deer that my buddy has a video of that his friend took. And he said, it's, it's in Ohio. And I said, just literally just like total shot in the dark, kind of joking. I said, does he have like five drop tines? And he looked at me and was like, how do you know? And I was like, dude, no way. <laughs> I was like, where's your buddy? And he's like, he's over here. Let's go talk to him. So he, I, I go up to this guy, and he shows me this video. And in the video, you can see this deer. And so I think it was the same deal, like a railroad kind of deal or something or other. But you can see graffiti in the background. And I was like, that's a landmark. I, c- I can find that. You can see the deer. You can see him walking yeah. through all this brush. And then like a hundred yards in the background, you see this building with graffiti on it. And I was like, I'm going to find that graffiti. <laughs> and if I find that graffiti, that means that this deer is real. Cause yeah. at this point, like I really don't, I don't have any no, confirmation where that is or whatever. Yeah. I have no evidence that the deer is even real at, at, at this point. It's just been like total shot in the dark. So, um, I have that, that video, that information and I start, I spent, I don't even know how long I spent. I mean, it was it was maybe a couple of weeks on my computer and my phone, just like every day spending hours like searching, 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 like using 3D imagery. And like after, I don't even know how many days of looking, I finally found the graffiti that matched that building. And it was like, it was like pretty, I was like 90% certain it was the graffiti from the, the aerial imagery I was looking at. And so like, I was like, holy, you know, th- this, this might be real. And so, um, that's, uh, so you were just looking like on Google or something. I was using Spartan forge. I was using, you know, Google's got that like 3d imagery that you yeah. like, you could, you could place the man on the road kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was using every, all that I stuff. Gotcha. So finally was able to like, see that graffiti mark the pen. And it was, it was, um, it was actually like pretty close to one of the pins that I had dropped of the 15 pins or whatever of, of the grocery store railroad thing. So, um, so then after that, like I made a trip up in, I think it was, I don't know the exact month, sometime mid late spring, mid summer time frame, And I literally just drove up there just to like, just to, I didn't even have time to like door knock or really like dig into all. It was just like, just to match the graffiti. And, uh, I drove up and, and matched the graffiti. And so it like, <laughs> at that point I was like, this is 100% real. Yeah. My next question is like, it's now, you know, spring, summer. Like I have no idea if this deer is already dead. The last, the only picture I have of it was like November 1st. Yeah. And it's like, you know, the deer could have already been taken by another hunter. He could have been hit by a car. He could have been just died of, you know, what deer die of all the time in suburban areas, hung up on fences, you know, old yep. age, Hit disease, whatever. What, yeah, anything. Yep. So I'm like, okay, I've confirmed like this is real. Um, but I have no idea if the deer is even alive, like no idea if he's still out there. So I finally matched where it was and the location of where he was seen in November. I also know November's a lot of times a very long ways away from where a deer will summer. I mean, he could have been, 10 miles away he could be a mile away anywhere in between so basically starting the summer campaign like i start making all kind of trips i'm door knocking 
and I'm surrounding this area. It's a really, really hard place to get permission. It's not like our normal stuff where it's like a bunch of houses and they all own, you know, property to hunt kind of thing. It's like uh, a, a lot of industrial, just like inner city kind of stuff. And, uh, you know, I'm getting all these spots and like, I'm realizing quickly, like this is most of these places that I'm hunting have a lot of homeless camps in them. Like there's heroin needles laying around. There's like, like by the, by the hundreds, there's pill bottles, there's crack pipes. There's like, I mean, you name it. Like, dude, there's all kinds of contraband in these places. And I'm running into these people. Like, dude, it was, I, I quickly, like, became pretty uneasy of, like, the environment I was in. And I, I quickly was like, how does this deer even live here? That was like, how how does this deer even exist in this place? Because it's just, like, he, he not conducive to, to yeah. Whitetail. There's, there's so yeah. many homeless people. That it was like, you know, wh- wh- what is this deer doing? So, <clears throat> I long story short, I'm searching this area around where I, I matched the video. Turns out I wasn't even within three miles of the deer. He was actually four miles away. And what happened was a buddy of mine that lives up there is a, v- a very good friend. He had a friend of his, and he's in the know of like, we share pictures and stuff and share information. Yeah. And, and so a buddy of his calls him and his, I th- one of his relatives owned like a scrap yard up there or something. And his relative, like, I guess, um, I, I don't even know who it was that he got these pictures from, but some, someone came up to him at the scrap yard and was like, Oh, have, have you seen the deer that's running around here? And the guy was like, no. And so he showed him these pictures and in, in velvet. And the guy was like, can you send me those? And so he sent them to this guy who had the scrapyard. <clears throat> and then he sent them to this other guy. He's now a friend of mine who had the mutual friend with me. And so this guy who's uh, fa- family, like on the scrapyard calls my buddy. And he's like, dude, there is this deer. That's, that's huge. He has <laughs> massive drop tines. And he's like, my family owns like the scrap yard there. And he's like, he, he was over there. I, I think he like put it, put some cameras out and was over there like scouting and stuff. And so, so he was hunting the deer. Yeah, yeah. 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 There was a bunch of people hunting the deer. So he told my buddy and my buddy said, you'll never guess who's hunting that deer or searching for that deer. And then the guy that, that his family owned the scrap yard was like Lee. And the, and then my buddy was like, yep. And so he basically was like, <clears throat> was fine to share the pictures and stuff. Yeah. And so that is how I eventually found out that the deer was four miles away was through happenstance of like this, this, my friend who has a friend whose family member owns the scrap yard, who got these pictures, who sent them to their, to my buddy's friend, who's also, you know, it, it was kind of, again, crazy circumstances. <laughs> But I remember seeing him like, I'm like, oh my gosh, like the deer made it. And he's like, this is, this is insane. And so I'm like, at this point, I'm already all in. Like I've, I've made, I don't even know how many trips, how much time, effort, gas money, freaking, you know, all meals, like time, effort, everything that's already gone into this. Like, right. You know, before I even knew the deer existed or was still alive. So that's how I ended up finding the location. And then of course I start e-scouting and um start door knocking and it's it's like i knew that this deer was gonna break from that area during the rut during the rut well yeah. i thought during the rut he ended up breaking way sooner, sooner. than that yeah. and, I, and i'll get to that so um I've, I've got this deer summer area i've dropped pins there's probably there's probably five properties maybe maybe six uh, that were like, you know, would have a chance at him early around his summer area. Yeah. So I start door knocking and like, again, it's a lot of it is like industrial properties. Um, you know, like it, it's, it's not, it's not like, you know, uh, it's not, it's not like there's, you know, a ton of houses where someone says, no, you just go to the next one. Right. So I ended up getting like, uh, I ended up getting, 
at the end of the day, like before the season started, I think I had five spots total to hunt that deer. But there were three in particular, four including the um, the scrapyard that my buddy's buddy had, but three that I was trying my best to get on early season. Yeah. So one of them was a small piece of property um, owned by some guy. I drove to that guy's house, and he was like, I spoke to the wife at first, and she was like, oh, this, you know, all about it. Like, I, I think her grandkids were into bow hunting or, or into archery or something like that. So we had a good conversation. She was like, he's not home. Come back tomorrow. I came back the next day, and he was, like, adamantly opposed, just not not about it for whatever reason. And he said, <clears throat> he was like, uh, but if you want to talk to my realtor, the property's for sale. So I was like, immediately in my head, like, I used to do real estate. So out of college, I worked on a farm. Then I came back to Atlanta and sold real estate or uh, uh, sold life insurance. Wore a suit and tie every day, hated it. And then I did real estate where like I was finding land for developers. Right. So my my first thought was like, I'm gonna find someone to develop this property. And long story short, I didn't find anybody that wanted this property. It's in like a horrible part of town, and like, you know, I was like, I even called you. I was like, <laughs> I was about to say, uh, I looked at it. And I know. I was like, yeah. Nah. Kendall does real estate too. And I was like, do you know anybody that would want this property? I'm like, you know, if the finders, typically I guess there's like a finder's fee where if you find a piece of property that like someone developed, there's like a, you get paid like a percentage or some, yeah, something. Yeah, refer- referral. Referral, yeah. yeah. I was like, man, if I found someone that like genuinely wanted to develop this place, because it was, it was zoned for development. Like it's, it's, it's it, the plan was for, for the place to be developed. Yeah. I was like, if I can find somebody that wants it, like maybe they'll let me hunt before they do it. That was the original plan that, like, the light bulb went off in my head. Long story short, like, wasn't able to even come close to finding anybody that <laughs> wanted it. Just because, like, it's in a bad part of town. It's it's 10 hours away from home. Right. Like, I didn't know anybody, you know, up there either. Like, most of my contacts and stuff were down here. And, like, we've never taken that route to try and hunt a place before. Uh, it's all been traditional door knocking stuff. But, it, but, but for the deer like this, I was like you know, I'll do anything possible. Yeah. But I mean, people buy land to hunt on all the time. Yeah. So. Yeah. I, uh, I, I, w- I w- was tempted to buy it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. So I, well, I'll, I'll kind of get to that point in the story. So, um, I ended up like talking with the realtor and, um, I actually became close with the realtor and when I, cause I was trying to find somebody to buy it and, and I just, I just never wasn't able, able to find anybody. Yeah. And I, and I, I told him, I was like, you know, if, if the property changes hands, like, you know, please let me know. I would love to talk to the new owner. And so that, the realtor, uh, let me put cameras out there. He was curious of what was going on. Cause like, again, all the homeless, homeless stuff. Like he wanted people, uh, he wanted an idea of what was going on on the property. Um, so I was able to put cameras out through the realty guy or the, through the realtor. Um, he and I went out there and, uh, so I was like, you know, showed him where the camera was and like I was sending him pictures of like people that were coming through yeah so that was one spot and then another spot um the guy was like really concerned about liability and I ended up talking with him for you know like over a month and same deal like he was totally fine with running trail cameras so I was like running tr- tr- trail cameras on that property another <laughs> this is another funny story so another property I was trying to get was a church um and so I'm, I'm, I go up there, I'm talking to the grounds guy, I'm kind of giving him the spiel and, uh, he's a hunter himself and he's all for it. He's like, they have a little garden and he's like at night, the deer crushing our garden. Yeah. Um, so he introduced me to the head of security. Who's also a big hunter. And both of these guys were all about it. They were like, but you've got to talk to the elders or like the, um, trustees of the church. And they were like, the only way to catch them is if you come to a Sunday service. And they were like, so why don't you come to this service next Sunday and, like, we'll kind of get it arranged where you can, you know, have your chance to talk to them. Yeah. I was the only white guy. Hey, man. And Nothing it was wrong aw- with that. And it was awesome. <laughs> I was extremely nervous walking into this church because, um, like, people are really dressed up. And you know, I was wearing like, uh, you know, jeans and like a collared shirt. Right. But you know, I walk in and like, I was welcomed, like, 
unanimous. I mean, it was everyone was extremely nice. Uh, that's awesome. But natural part of it, I'm the only white guy. They're 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 like, who is this guy? What are you doing here? Yeah. So I was getting a lot of looks, <laughs> like a lot, and that was my first time experiencing a church like that. And uh, the amount of energy was through the roof. Yeah. I mean, like the dancing, the yelling, the screaming. Like, people are exhausting themselves where they are just, like, dripping in sweat from the amount of, like, physical activity they're putting into this church service was just, like, jumping. Oh, and yeah. I mean, so, like, I, I'm, like, you, I, I'm kind of, like, how do I act, you know? Like, <laughs> I don't want to just start jumping. I was, up. About, I was about to say, did you get into it? I mean, yeah. you know, I was, I was, you know, bobbing my head and tapping my feet and stuff, but, like, I definitely wasn't, like, <laughs> jumping up and down and screaming and yelling and uh so it was it was honestly a, an amazing experience oh, to, I bet. to yeah. go to that church service and just like see a different side of church yeah in a sense or to see a different side of, of worship really and so i had my chance to like talk to the trustees uh at the end of the church service and they had just been sued by Someone a few months earlier that like got cut on a piece of barbed wire fence they had on their property. Jeez. And so they were like, you know, bow hunting. They're like, you know, we're for it. But he, but they they were just like, there's just no way that like we literally just got sued. They were like, we can't, you know, we just. Yeah, you can't fr- deal with yeah, the liability. Yeah. yeah. So that was the biggest concern across the board in that area was liability. And like, I think what a lot of people over there were concerned about was like, you know, what if a homeless guy walks in front of you and he gets shot, which is such a far-fetched yeah. situation. They look just like deer. Right. Yeah. It's like, you know, we're looking for a specific deer <coughs> that, that like, you know, if a 10-pointer walks in and we're hunting an 11-pointer, like, that's not we the deer the we're difference. hunting. Yeah, it, we're yeah. looking at the exact details. And so it's like the homeless, you know, it's not a real concern. But to them, just from not really understanding, like, you know, that it just, it was a concern. Yeah. So I didn't end up getting that church. Um, I do still talk, talk to those guys after I shot this deer, both of them sent me a congratulations text. (laughs) That's awesome. And I will most definitely be going back to a church service at some point. Um, so I'm trying to think of where to go from here. So, well, when did you first see the deer? Oh, so I first saw him after, um, finding out the area he was in from my buddy's buddy. And so I went up there and basically like was driving around and saw the deer in a field from my truck. And like when I laid eyes on him, you almost wrecked. I I mean, I, I was, I was in disbelief of what I was watching. And I remember calling you, I called Drew and I was like, this is one of the most impressive whitetails walking planet earth right now yeah. like it's when you first sent me the video i was like yeah that's not real so i you know i was i was trying to get permission like to try and get on them early i ended up getting permission basically in in every direction you know a mile over here a mile a mile to the west a mile to the north a mile to the south a mile to the east like surrounding him to where when he breaks you know i would potentially have a chance at him when he leaves his core area because at this point in time i only have trail camera permission i don't have any hunting permission at all right but i know that this deer is gonna gonna break and leave so i filmed this deer like a couple times and i just remember feeling a sense of like even if i don't ever have a chance at this deer my heart is full like i felt content just just seeing something just to see a deer like that caliber is nuts yeah as someone who lo- genuinely like and passionately loves whitetails just to see a deer like that was all i could have ever asked for that doesn't mean that i wasn't going to try my best to pursue that deer right so <clears throat> um yeah that was that was kind of the first time and again like there's so much to the story i'm kind of probably jumping around a little bit and i'm sure i'm going to leave out certain details but um i ended up getting permission like on outskirts places and as I'm getting permission in these outskirts places, I'm quickly realizing there's a lot of people that hunt here, hunt around here. Right. Hunting in this city is extremely popular. And there's a reason for that because people know that there are giants that live up there. Yeah, there's little deer up there. Yeah. So 
I think, and especially like on the back end, I think I realized that there were probably at least 10 guys that I know of that, that were hunting that deer. Um, and it was just like, you know, <clears throat> I only knew from just word of mouth and then door knocking and stuff. But like after the fact, you know, all these trail cam pictures or get sent around stuff like that. Right. It's like there's, you know, there was, there was a lot of people that were trying to, trying to get on this deer, um, at places they had and similar, similar deals to what I was doing was like, you know, a mile of the North, mile of South, this, that, and the other, there were way more options. But what was crazy was, and what I learned was this deer, like, I mean, when we pulled his jaw open, he had no front teeth and I still have his jawbone. His, his, I've showed several people that, that look at deer, uh, jawbones and age them. And they're like, this deer is ancient. They're like, I mean, 12, like 10, 12, like don't know, but it's like 10 plus. Are you, yes, you're sending it. I'm going to get it sent off to know for sure. But the reason I say that is like, he knew that area, like the back of his hand. He knew exactly where and when to be at any given time. Because when he left this summer area, he went four miles away. Like the, the summer area was like a perfectly protected secluded place there was no homeless activity no no homeless activity like in what his core area was to where like if he beds down there he's not gonna be bothered all day long um and then when he left and went four miles away he found another place that was almost identical where he can't be touched and he's not being bothered by uh, homeless camps or nothing like that like he's secluded and i think when that deer left um and went the four miles i think he took the railroad I think he just hopped on the railroad and just, just walking boom. straight down the railroad. But I think that he had such a vast knowledge of that area that that's why he was behaving the way that he was. But you were having a lot of trespassers and oh, people uh, showing up on your camera. Constantly. Like you were having cameras stolen. Um, I mean, so what do you, what role do you think that had in him going to the other? spot like four miles away Uh, he bypassed so much stuff like and i had i had all these spots where there were abandoned camps i'm just like man i just don't see a deer or active camps and i'm like i just don't see this deer being in in these places and he wasn't he bypassed all of it so like a to b like there wasn't much in between a and b that he's spending time in it's like he wasn't comfortable in a and he went four miles to B, and he had other places he went. Because even again, like after the fact, people sent you, in pictures. You figured out kind of where else he was Dude, at. Dude, people sent in pictures, and, and they're like telling me this is the road it was off of. And I'm like, that's another freaking two miles more to the north of the four miles away place. And I'm like, this deer, like. All over the place. All over. I mean, yeah, it's like the deer that I shot a couple of weeks ago. I mean, he was a roamer, too. It's just certain personalities of deer are just like. I'm not hanging out here and I'm going somewhere else. Yeah. And, and my, also my perspective of this deer too, was a lot of deer up in this city are very well known. Like they're running through neighborhoods. A lot of people have pictures and I hunted, well, I had a spot to hunt a deer that was 240 inches. So way bigger than this deer two seasons ago. And I elected to pass on that deer because not that I physically pass on him, but I had a spot that I could hunt him. And I was like, you know what? There's there's too many pictures of this deer. It's going to be too much drama. I got two guys hunting next door to me, one on the property next to me, one on the property next to that guy. And I'm just like, I don't want to be sitting in this spot hunting and be looking at two other guys that are also sitting there hunting. And we're all just sitting there looking at each other. Like, I like to walk away from that situation. My perspective on this deer was I was like, how does nobody know about him? Right. I, I, dude, there were no pictures of this deer at all. Like, from when I got sent the pictures, like, in December of last year to probably summertime, like, July, August time frame, no, I, I saw no pictures of this deer. Like, nothing being sent around, nothing being posted on Facebook, like, nothing. And then as it gets closer to the season, I start seeing some pictures like in videos start to surface. And like someone even posted on uh, on a Facebook forum a picture of this deer, the road name it was off of, and said like this deer's huntable, 
it's off this road and was like this year it was yeah this summer <laughs> and i'm like dude why why would someone post that because we've seen time and time again oh, yeah. where someone catches wind of a deer that and the deer just disappears that happened in nashville on a 220 230 inch deer where it made it onto facebook it went viral some lady posted and was like i saw this behind my office this morning it's the buck is now known as like the maserati monster oh that's right yeah um, I, I, I don't know but some guy drove from like about. you know two hours away and shot it that night with a rifle so it's like i was even just the fact that that deer didn't get poached um with as known as it became like with these pictures getting posted and like i was freaking out because i'm like man that deer's just gonna vanish right um so my perspective was like the whole time until about August, I was just like, how does nobody know about this deer? Like, I, uh, to this point, I'm like, no, I, nobody knows about him. Well, you were pretty secretive about it, I would imagine, if somebody I think else every, knew yeah, about it. I think everyone was be being. pretty secretive, too. Yeah. So, wow. so anyways, I ended up, yeah, I, I got a couple spots. Like, one spot, I had three cameras stolen. Um, I even put a, a air tag in a, a camera, like, trying to catch these guys, and like constantly dealing with stolen cameras, this, that, and the other, just nonsense. Did they take the camera with the air tag in? No, or no, no. I think that they were. I think they were watching me, like wherever they were at. I think they were watching me because when I was putting cameras out, it was almost immediately they would steal them. Yeah. But then when I put the air tag in, like I, it's almost like they were seeing me or hearing me do it. Hmm. And there's like all kinds of old RVs. It was like an old uh, auto yard where I had permission, and there was like you know, three acres of woods behind it. People just living in vans. I think so, yeah. Um, so I had, I had, you know, I, I can't remember, I got three, three-ish spots at this point, all in the outskirts. I start getting pictures of this deer at both of the places that I've got permit camera permission on. And my buddy, Kyle, who I always stay with up there, he's become like a, a super, super, super close friend of mine. Um, I, I'm staying with him on his, in, on his couch every time I go up there. And he's he was also hunting a uh, – he he's already killed it now. It, was to, it ended up scoring 205. Yeah, and he I, has a lot of history with that. Yeah, too. I just watched that uh, last night. Super awesome yeah. episode. It's on YouTube. And you talk about a guy that, like, deeply loves whitetails, like – He's he he is similar to I am, where there's like almost an extreme sadness when you take a deer that you've like almost gotten to know. Yeah, he is he is he loves deer and he is a very very good person. So he's he's in the know of every detail, just like I'm in the know of every detail with the deer that he killed. Metric, we're going over there and glassing this deer and getting spotting scope footage of of his deer. Metric, right. And he's in the know of every of the details of you know me going to the church and like the auto place and camera stolen and that I've got trail cam permission this that and the other. <clears throat> so this deer starts showing up on both of those places I've got camera permission. One of them more particular than the other. He's showing up a lot more on this other one. And Kyle calls me one day. This was totally unprompted. I I had literally just like almost thought of these two properties of like just. A, a way to like keep tabs on the deer right. if he's in his quarry area or when he's like left or whatever. I'm still trying to get this other place um, that the guy was concerned about liability. Um, so, but the, the property that I originally talked about with the property that was for sale, he calls me one day and this is totally unprompted, but he, he's in the know. He, he I told him the property's for sale, all this stuff. So he, has a uh, business partner of his and they do development and he's like getting into it more. And he had a, his guy look at the property and the guy was like, yeah, I want it. So they bought it or they, they said that they were going to put an offer in. Okay. And he was like, the plan is to develop it. If we get it, I'll let you, we'll let you hunt the month of October, but just the month of October. He's like, after that, I, I can't tell you what so, the plan is. So were they going to hunt it? Do you think? Mm. I don't know. I don't. I mean, they may hunt it now, but he was hunting 
a deer you had multiple three years of history with uh, another okay, 200 okay. i got you yeah and i told him i literally said i said kyle i was like dude if y'all if y'all get that property and you want to develop i was like dude you hunt the deer i i literally told i said dude you hunt the deer and he was like absolutely not <laughs> he was like absolutely not you didn't give me that offer when i mentioned buying the property <laughs> <laughs> So I, that was that was what I told him first. I was like, dude, you hunt the deer. And he was like, yeah. no. He's like, dude, absolutely. He's like, I know what amount of effort you've put in the last year. He's like, no. Yeah. He's like, me and this guy want it to develop it. And they're going to make, they're going to, it's a good investment. Like they're going to, they're going to do well with it. Uh, but he was like, but the only, and he's like, because I think it was his, uh, his business partner that was like the one who was kind of the, the main development guy and stuff. So yeah. He was like, but that guy said like only the month of October, and then after that, like, you know, you you <clears throat> you can't hunt there anymore. So yeah, I told him I was like, dude, a day, like I'll I'll take anything because at this point it's I'd given up on the property. I mean, I I'd, right. I'd given up. I literally I I'd, I'd try to find somebody that would wanted it for development. Like I I remember just like at that point when I I was like, let's get creative, and I was yeah. like, that's when I was like, okay. Maybe I can find someone who wants it. Blah blah blah. blah. I had given up on that. I had it. It just I'd moved on down the road because I was just like it's just not going to happen. Um, so I was trying to get this other property that like was concerned with liability. I kept just you know getting to know him. I was like helping clean up some of the homeless trash and stuff like that. Just like trying to build rapport with them. Um, and th until Kyle called me, and so they ended up putting an offer in on the property, and they get it. And so he calls me and tells me. And I'm like, you talk about like <laughs> disbelief that that's hap that this is happening, right? You know, it it was like that. That's what I felt like. Yeah. Um, and that was like the best place to get on that deer early. Like he he took to ended up taking to that area and got really defensive of it. Like was blasting scrapes and like all kinds of stuff. What do you think it was about that? property in particular that drew him there it was it t in my mind i think it was the closest uh place with hardwoods that so he had food and yeah oh yeah cover food and cover everything and so he had he had everything he wanted in in that place and then the other place that he was showing up at which not as much but still showing up at was mostly like uh it's uh it's similar to privet i need to look up what it is it's very brushy Okay. Uh, it, it's, it's a green leaf and it stays green even into the winter months and it has little red berries on it. They have it a lot in Tennessee and the deer, the deer pound it. Huh. Like a holly bush or something? Kind of. Yeah. I need to look up what it is, but that would have been a great late season spot. The other spot, but this place was, there's, there just wasn't a ton of hardwoods up there. Right. And this was the closest place that had hardwood. So there was acorns that were falling in there. And so I think that probably for a long time, he'd just been transitioning over you know, from his summer place to this place. And then, uh, then he was just, you know, expanding f and traveling from there. So, but I mean, you were constantly getting homeless people and people like peeing in front of your camera. Oh yeah. Had no clue yeah. was there. I mean, that had to have some effect in him, like going back and forth to these different properties. I had a I mean, Satanist come. Th I have videos of a Satanist come through. He was drunk. He had a bottle of it looked like Captain whiskey Morgan or in something pocket. in his yeah. pocket. Yeah. And he was wearing a shirt that had like an up down, upside down cross on it, and it was. I, I will get into the details of the horrible stuff that I experienced at the end, but I'm trying to bypass that stuff to just kind of gotcha. tell the story, All and right. then and then I'll tell the rest of of the horrible stuff. So. Um, so anyways, uh, I have basically only the month of October for that place. Again, very wild scenario. This is like, this is never, we've never, uh, to this point, it's just been normal door knocking. Right. And I was super fortunate. Like they wanted the property and that that situation unfolded. Like it all started with door knocking. So, yeah, but so I still am getting other places because I know this deer is going to leave. The season opens September 30th, and um, this deer, I, I have no history with him. I, I, have, I have no history, so I have no idea what he's going to do. Right. But I'm I'm set up to hunt on that property, and I'm set up to hunt on these other properties. So fast forward to opening day. 
the deer's showing up a lot. Then he'll go missing for, you know, three, two, three, four days, at, sometimes at a time. Still don't know where he was going. Um, but he started using that area a lot. And so we were set up opening day and, and I, there was this one trail coming into this property that I called the hot gates. And it was like, I knew every time he was in there and when he wasn't, because he would always take that trail in. And if he would take that trail in and, and you didn't see a video of him leaving, he was still in there. So he was bedding in there. So when he was bedding in there, I mean, he, it's his bedroom. Like he's morning and 12 o'clock, one o'clock, two o'clock up on his feet again. Cause Deer do that a lot in oh, their yeah. super core areas, which is get up, feed around, lay back down. Like we watched Charlie in his kudzu patch. He'd get up 10 times a day, Yeah, hop up, feed around for a few minutes, lay back down. back down. So um, this deer like takes basically opening day. The deer comes in um, that night. Let me – hold on. I'm trying to think. The deer came in. I, dude, there's. I'm trying to. I even, think, so I'm trying to remember if I even hunted opening morning. I think I, I did. Okay, what am I thinking? Okay, so <laughs> the deer comes in um, at night. I don't know, two o'clock at night, three o'clock at night, something like the that. The night before season. The right? night. The, yeah, the night before season, and he doesn't leave, so I know he's in there. So we slide in in the morning, and the plan is to sit all day because, like, I'm I'm hunting a scrape, and um, you know, he would check the scrape at. 12 o'clock to between 12 and 2. Yeah. So we're sitting there, 10 o'clock, 10 a.m. hits. We, we, we've we seen does, no sign of him. 10 a.m. hits. I'm like, man, I got I to gotta take a deuce. Like it's hitting me bad. <laughs> so I'm like, but no, we just need to, we, I need to push. Need yeah. to push through. So Not that kind of push. Not that kind of push. Okay. So 1 o'clock hits, and I'm like, dude, I look at Cody. I was like, I can't take this anymore. I just can't. So <laughs> – I was like, let's run to the store. Uh, we'll get down for, for. We'll be we'll be gone twenty minutes. Yeah. Out of the whole day, we'll be gone twenty minutes. We'll be right back. Run to the store, go to the restroom, check my fa- my camera, and he's standing in front. Uh, he's standing in there. So, I'm we're sitting there like mad dash. I, like we left the camera in the tree, left the bow in the tree, we left everything in the tree because like we're gonna be gone for twenty minutes. Yeah, so I thought you just got down and literally dropped a deuce like at the base of your tree. No, I didn't. Okay. <laughs> no, I didn't want to, even though, you know, that's probably customary Get, to that area. Well, uh, right, with all of the, because literally either that day or right before that, some guy was like peeing in front of your camera. Yeah. So it's, yeah, I also forgot to mention that like the cameras I had in this property, um, this this deer went missing for like several, several days and there were people that were, um, not supposed to be on that property that looked the part of someone who was very suspicious of like trying to track that deer down. When you have a deer skull on your arm tattoo, you yeah. would think that he's a deer hunter. Yeah. So it's like, yeah, I, I was, as it got close to opening day, like I just started to see way more suspicious activity. Even while I was at the church service um, trying to get permission from there, they the security I caught I think he said it was one guy that ran into their property and was running back out with a, a cell camera and hopped back in their truck. And uh, I think he talked to the guy or whatever. And um, But he basically caught someone that was sticking a camera on the either on the church property or the city property next door to the church property. So And he told me that when we got a service. So like people were trying to, you know. Well, people were looking for make a big deer or maybe deer. on that deer in particular. Yeah. Right? So like, yeah. So people were you know, sniffing around for sure. Yeah. And like, I was seeing it on my trail cameras in this place. So like people were trying to move in on them, <clears throat> but so we're coming, we, I go to the restroom, run it, rushing back to the stand and he's in there. Our entrance to the, get in the stand was extremely sneaky and we were actually able to slip in. We had all kind of brush and stuff in our way. And like, I'm using the binos and I, I can see him. He's like facing away, and we actually slid up the back of the tree with him facing away. Got back in, and he he never. How came, far away was it? Seventy yards. Oh, jeez. He never came. He never came in. He went back, laid back down, and then he took the hot gates, the the back trail out of that property that evening. We sat the rest of the day, didn't see him. He took the back trail out of that evening, and I was sitting there like, no big deal. Like, 
he likes this place. Uh, you know, we'll we'll get another chance at him. Like, just you know, we're gonna play this thing smart, whatever. Uh, that deer left that spot for ten days. Ten days was gone, and that was September thirtieth, so opening day. And he, I know now that he moved four miles away. And I never would have ever suspected that that deer would have made that big of a move that early. That is so uncharacteristic of a deer like that to make that big of a move. Yeah, that's why I just think that the whole homeless, like all of those people randomly coming through could have just bumped him out of there. Yeah. So I I don't know what he, he, either he just wanted to do it or there was some, something else that I just didn't know about. I don't know. But I just never would have suspected in like, you know, eight days, seven or eight days go by. There's no sign of this deer. I'm still getting permission to put cameras in other places like that make sense that he would go to. Right. Nothing. No sign of this deer. And I'm like, dude, he he might be dead. Someone got him. That's, I mean, that's, those thoughts start to creep in. Yeah. So the last thought I had in my head was, I know where that picture was taken by the graffiti in November. I was like, it is a long ways away, but that's like one of the last places, areas that I haven't searched. And it was in the evening. It was pouring rain. We went out there <clears throat> and we're walking these trails and, uh, you know, using binos. It's, it's public trails. And we're using these binoculars and like I'm looking through all this like CRP type brush. I see this little buck walking through and then behind him I see rack. And I was like, oh, my God. I was like screaming. I was like screaming. I was like, it's him, it's him, it's him. And it was like. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. It was like, I mean, seven days of searching. And it was it was just process of elimination to end up like. And if it weren't for the one video and the graffiti stuff, I never would have ever, ever have seen that deer and, and had a clue that he was there. So there was one property uh, where he moved the four miles away where he uh they the guy that owned it it was like a development company in North Carolina and i was literally about to drive 10 hours to go door knock on this guy's house just cuz it, i it was one of the first places that i tried to get permission <clears throat> and i was calling into their office trying to get in touch with somebody they were just ghosting you yeah i just you know phone call no one, no one gives you the time yeah and i was like you know they already kind of just a uh, liability no so then I was like, you know what? I need to find like the actual owner of this company and go knock on their door and like give it, get a face to face. And so I was willing to drive the 10 hours just to have a chance to knock on this guy's door to see if he would let us hunt. And then it was, you know, that was basically the only option in the, the four mile away place. So I go back over there and, you know, I'm trying to like glass the deer the next couple of days. And like, of course he goes missing again. And I'm like, I don't know where he's at. But basically, we had made a decision that on, I think it was day 10, that we were going to leave town and go door knock that door, that guy in North Carolina. Because I, I assumed he was still in that place four miles away. We just weren't seeing him. There was right. tons of places he could be. Um, Sunday morning, or, or that 10th day morning, I'm driving around in the morning glass and trying to see him. We're planning on basically leaving that day to go, go door knock, drive the 10 hours. And boom, he shows back up on the spot four miles back yeah. where we had our encounter with him opening day. I remember that text, and I was like, no way. Yeah. So long story short, um, we basically, <coughs> he, he he took the trail in through the hot gates, didn't leave, so we know he was still in there. We set up on the hot gates and caught him as he left that evening because, like, that's what he did on opening day was he left on the hot gates in the evening. Yeah. And we set up on the hot gates in the evening and caught caught him coming out. And that's how we ended up catching up with that deer. But what I the, the part I've I've rushed through so many details because we've already been talking for an hour. I need to go get in a freaking tree. I'm already late. I know. But the details of what I went through in the meantime of like all of this part of this deer was uh that I'll that I'll tell you is so the um the first thing was the property that um the two places I had trail camera permission at 
the one that I ended up being able to hunt, they found a dead uh, 12 year old that was killed on that property. Well, I don't, we don't, they don't know if, if th that person was killed on that property or just dumped on that property, but it was basically the property we were hunting in May. So we're hunting in end of September. In May, they found a dumped 12 year old, which is extremely sad. And they like had marked the whole area off and treated it as like a homicide investigation. And, um, like when, when I found that out, like extremely un unsettled that like you're hunting a place that you don't know what happened there. And it's like, yeah, it just really, uh, brought a deep sense of like, uh, darkness, I guess, um, to hunting that place, just knowing, knowing what had happened there. Yeah. The other place that I had trail camera permission on, um, there was a homeless camp in there and, uh, I got pictures of this guy coming out of the woods and he ended up smashing my trail camera when he saw it. But, um, I went over there to, you know, go fix my camera or whatever. And what had happened was, um, I knew where this homeless person was in that, and on that property I'd walked past their camp and uh, it was a, a lady and she, um, overdosed on drugs and died in her camp there. And so, they had to send a ambulance down the railroad tracks and load her up and take her out. And like a bunch of the homeless guys, you know, kind of wrote all this on her, on her tent, like a bunch of Sharpie, just like notes and stuff like that, that person had, you know, passed away there. Um, we were driving by a park one day and, uh, in that area, it's like a, like a, you know, swing set park kind of thing, like kids playing moms out there. And, um, these ladies had a one of their had their pit bull out there, and uh, uh, her, uh, some another pit bull that had gotten loose like got into a fight with their dog that they had, and so Cody and I are, are driving by, and we see this pit bull fight going on, and, and there's just women that are trying to to break it up, and there's these kids that are screaming and stuff. So we we pull over and we run out there and we like help try to help get the pit bull fight broken up. So when when we get that well, that happens. And as we're walking back to the truck, I see this guy walking out, and I assume that the women who had their pit bull uh, called their dad. And so this guy, big dude, comes walking out, and I said, Cody, he's got a gun. And he had a gun stashed in his pocket. And so he goes up to the other dog that had kind of gotten loose, and, and a, a homeless guy had tied him off to a trash can at that point by his collar. And this, this guy walks out with a handgun, he pulls it out of his pocket, and he's just waving it around like in the park. <clears throat> and like again there's still there's kids, kids like kids w moms everywhere he drags this dog by the collar into the middle of this park and dumps his whole clip of of his handgun into this dog in front of everybody and the dog like takes off running falls in the in the street and is laying he's laying there alive for like 30 minutes and we're sitting standing there like you know 10 feet from the dog and and like so police end up showing up animal control showed up and the dog's just sitting there and i'm like can I, pl I know y'all can't, but can I please shoot this dog and put him down? Because this is unbearable to watch. And I understand why they couldn't, because the owner may have wanted to try and take it to the vet and save it. There was no saving this dog. Yeah. Geez. Like that was, again, that was like another just like really hard thing to see. Like this sweet dog just, you know, filled with bullet holes. Um, And then... The next day, literally the next day, in the same spot that that happened, we park our car and we get down one of this vehicle that looked abandoned. And like every hunter knows the smell of death, of something that's dead. We get down one of it, smell it, and it's like I'm like instantly I'm like some that's something dead. And we look at the corner of this car and there's like three or four hundred flies just like all on the corner of this vehicle. And so. We look in this vehicle and there's a big Tupperware bin like this, this big. And that's, that's where the stench was coming from. And I was just thinking like, maybe it's just someone's dog or, you know, whatever pet, something they have in there. <clears throat> and so Cody and I were trying to get out of town and I'm like, man, we just dealt with this cop deal yesterday and that took like over an hour. I was like, we're trying to leave town. Like we can't call this in and, and get roped into this thing. Well, we're never going to get home. So we ended up just like, you know, someone someone will call it in. So we leave town, come back the next time, and it 
turns out there was like an article that came out online where um, a vehicle, they had found a dead body um, in a vehicle that matched that description and it was in that area. Same, same, like, I can't tell you 100% that it was that vehicle, but like odds are it was that vehicle. And uh, you were in a awful part of town. Yeah. So there's one more story. There's there's a lot more other, and I can un- unpack it more. I, r- I really need to get in the tree. But um, the last like story that kind of stood out to me was um, we were leaving town. It was after we had gotten the deer, and we were leaving town. We're like trying to get some finishing shots, just like B-roll, like shots of the city and stuff like that. And there was, like, this vacant home that had, like, plywood boards and, like, a vacant sign on the side of it. And so we're – we Cody's hanging out of the window of the car, like, getting footage of the vacant sign. And these guys walk out, and they're carrying, like, DVD players. And for the most part, the homeless people I ran into were, were harmless. They were just – you know, they, they weren't carrying guns or anything like that. They they Most of them have knives. That's pretty much it, though, for self-defense. But none of them really have guns. These were the kind of guys that were like crooked thieves, like just no regard for life. These were the kind of guys that like you look at and you're like, okay, those are the kind of people that you don't want to run into. Like they're different than the homeless, you know, people kind of strung out on drugs kind of thing. So they walk out and they see Cody with this camera and uh, they they flipped out. They were like, what the F are you doing? You know, blah, 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 like, like you know, just start dog cussing us. And they're like, what the f- are you doing? And Cody's like, oh, we're just filming a documentary. And then uh, I didn't see it at the time, but they pulled out a pistol and racked it. And, th- I mean, they're standing, you know, 15 feet away from the car. And Cody was hanging out and saw him, heard him, like, like rack the pistol. I'm driving. I didn't see it. And Cody just, like, like comes back in the car and is like, go, 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 go. I didn't, I didn't know what was going on, like. And so I'm, like, kind of slowly driving off. And he's like, dude, go. Like, he got mad and was like, dude, go. And then as we're driving away, he that's when he told me they pulled out a pistol and racked it. And he was like, you know, th- those are the, like, and then so the last thing I'll say, too, is one of the, uh, a buddy of Kyle's who, you know, we, we get the deer, we, we bring him back. A buddy of Kyle's comes up to me. He lives in that city. And told him the area it was. And he was like, dude, you, he, said, he said two things. He said, one, <clears throat> we ended up sitting three times in the stand for this deer. Um, he said, if you sat four, something would have happened to you. He's like, he's like, if, if you if you just sat four times, like something would have happened. Both times I sat in the tree that we ended up killing him out of, I saw someone smoking crack uh, across the creek in the park. And so then um, – and the other thing he said too, he was like, "It's a good thing you killed him in three sits, because in four sits something would have happened." And he said, "I don't care how big this is a guy that lives around there." He said, "I don't care how big the deer is, I would not go over there." He said, "There's there's no deer big enough on this planet that would make me go through what you went through to go hunt that deer." And he was like, "It's it, that area is notorious." And so he pulled up uh, a website that shows crime reports, daily crime reports as they're happening from you know, certain areas. And so he pulled up this area and we're sitting there looking at it and it's like assault, assault, shooting, shooting, murder, like theft, all this vandalism. And it's like, shoot, like the amount of shootings is crazy. Uh, and so like, that is why I've reached the place where like, I feel like I've pushed the urban game as far as I'm willing to push it. Yeah. Um, and I am, uh, you know, wanting to kind of, Take it. Take a step back for the time being and reevaluate. So I'm hunting at home. I'm hunting at a buddy's. Um, I didn't want to start off with that heavy stuff because, like, I didn't want to just, you know, put a dark cloud over the whole story. But there, there, honestly, Kendall, there's, there's a lot more stories like that that I just probably am not even thinking of right now. Yeah, I mean, I've had similar stories like that here in Atlanta years back when I hunted some not so great parts of town, but yeah. that sounded like a lot in a very short period of time. And we probably need to be a lot more safe about our decisions, even though there's a giant deer around. Yeah. I was, um, 
I was carrying a pistol with me everywhere we went. Yeah. Like both Cody and I were carrying handguns with us every place that we went. Yeah. Especially getting a new spot, like you know. So it was um you know, I that deer you know, I, I one of the most one of my most favorite things that I do now, and this is what I'll close with. One of my most favorite things that I do now with every deer, because I we just put so much passion, so much energy, so much effort into the deer. Um, my favorite moment of the whole journey with this deer was sitting in the creek with him, and I feel like as hunters sometimes when we take a deer, there's such a rush to like, let's let's get him out. Like, let's get him drug out. Like, let's, you know, and it's almost like the moment of walking up on that deer and enjoying him, like, is is so brief. It's 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 literally just like that, and it's gone. In Kansas, I did it. For Kimbo, I did it. Where it's like when we found the deer and we walked up on him, we just sat down for, like, 15 minutes in, in just quietness. And I just yeah. sat down next to him. I had my hand on his back and just, like, got still just like listen to the the morning like that it was that morning like just listen to the to the world wake up yeah. listen to the sounds and um you know birds chirping creek running just like taking a minute to really like deeply appreciate that animal because i don't take it lightly what that deer went through in the place that he lived the amount of heroin needles he probably stepped on crack pipes he probably stepped on like you know, I also know of other stories of people. Uh, there was a, a park ranger of where this deer was at four miles away. And I was told this story where he went after that deer with a bow in the park and was caught doing it. So it's like, there's so many other ways that this deer could have died. Yeah. Um, hit by car, hung up on a fence, like just the, the extremely crazy environment and 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 what he walked past like he may have walked past a lot like i've only i only have lived a fraction of my life yeah, in that he, place 10 years or whatever the however 10 old 12 is, years yeah. of that deer like if i if i if that deer's 12 years old i was 21 when he was born so he's been around that long and it's like in that place there's no telling like what bodies he's seen like just yeah. just what he is what his everyday life was like and he survived in that environment for so long. And I, I just, I did not take it lightly at all that it was my arrow that, that finished him. And so I just like took that time to be still to like deeply respect that animal as best I possibly could. And that's why we put so much effort into our episode is like, I, I hope my hope is that like this deer is honored with the journey in the episode and like how much time and effort went into how much of, how much I poured into this deer. Yeah. Um, I just hope that that's like reflected in the episode because like this deer deserves it for the life he lived and for us to take him like that's, that's not a light thing. Yeah. That's a, that's a, that's a, uh, as a hunter, like that is a, a very heavy thing. So, yeah. well, congratulations on a deer of a lifetime and you are late to, yeah, I gotta go. I gotta deer. go. I really gotta go bad. Um, we, that we, you've had a lot of years of history with three years so um multiple encounters this far so far this season we really got to go because he gets in there early but, all right um i could probably tell a lot more details of the story yesterday i'm sure i missed a lot but that was me basically trying to tell it as quick as possible <laughs> but i appreciate you listening yeah and no, taking some yeah, time yeah, off i definitely learned evening, a lot so. more of the story that i did not know yeah. so all right well i'm gonna go get in a tree and uh hopefully i'll see you later tonight all right. If you, if, I hope so too. I guess I'll wait to go to Nashville <laughs> until it's dark. All right. Thank y'all for listening. All right. See y'all. All right, guys. This is the actual closing to the Kimbo podcast. Um, I just went hunting, and uh, it's the next day. I was kind of processing my thoughts, and like the last thing I want to do was rush through the story. I was like heavily distracted by running to the woods, um, and so I was sitting in the stand and just being like, you know what, I just need to make sure that I uh, do the story justice and everything by like fully unpacking my thoughts, especially my closing thoughts and my takeaways. So, um, for the sake of details, like I, th I was looking back at my map. I, all in all, I ended up having seven total spots of permission for Kimbo. 
Um, there was the Kyle spot and another spot I had that were more in the core area. He ended up sort of showing up on both of those. Um, so even if the Kyle spot uh, hadn't worked out, I had another spot that I think could have worked out early season. And I had a third spot that he showed up on one of my cameras um, that was probably a mile away. Uh, I think it was one of his transition areas sort of in between when he was doing his travel routes and things to where he ended up at the four-mile-away place. And uh, um, I, I was still 100% willing to go the 10 hours to try and uh, door knock the guy that had the – or the development company that had the place that, you know, was by his four-mile-away spot. But um, I think my biggest takeaways as kind of like sitting here digesting everything is I'm, I'm left in this place of where to go from here. Um, my biggest – hope is that you guys always take away um, something positive from our videos, a positive experience that, that you all got you all got to follow along for this journey and that there's some takeaways for you that you can take home, whether it's just get you excited about hunting and inspires you to go out on the whatever place you've got or inspires you to go find some ground, door knock, whatever, to, to get you outside. Like that's one of my, always one of our biggest takeaways or one of our biggest uh, hopes is that it encourages you guys to get out and go hunting. What I don't want this video to encourage you guys to do is to start going to a sketchy part of town or a dangerous area uh, just for the sake of pursuing a big deer. I think that is one of my biggest regrets in this story is that, you now while I was being safe, um, you know, I did have a camera guy, Cody or, or Tristan, with me a lot of the times. Um, I was by myself a lot, and I was always carrying a concealed weapon, but I wasn't letting someone know like where I was constantly. And um, I just there, there's more. This is not just about me. I've got a family at home. I've got friends. I've got a significant other, and I feel like I was not fully taking them into account on on this journey. I've I've really always tried to stay as true to myself as possible and never let a deer put blinders on my eyes. Um, I feel like I might have done that in a sense with this deer as far as personal safety goes. Um, no big deer is is worth it, is, is worth your personal safety. And so kind of on the opposite end of this thing, like looking back, I think that is some, one of my personal takeaways is that I will not be doing that again. I definitely will not be hunting an area that extreme ever again. Um, you know, I and I and I don't want y'all to watch it and and and, and y'all you want y'all's takeaways to be like, oh, I need to go to places like that. Please don't have that takeaway. Um, this was an extreme thing, and I'll also say, whether it's suburban, rural, anywhere in between, be safe wherever you go. Because one of my worst experiences was the kidnapping story in North Dakota, which happened in part of the most rural part of the country at 7:30 in the morning on a Sunday. And if y'all want to listen to that story, we recorded a podcast on it. It's on our channel. Um, so the safety thing was big for me on the takeaway stuff. And then it's it's kind of left me in this place where I feel like I've, I've reached this point. And I've, I've talked about this a couple of different times. But I really want to take a minute to just unpack this a little bit more because I want to hear from y'all. I really appreciate y'all's feedback. Um, I take it all to heart. And I feel like I'm less than left in this place of like where to go from here. And to be honest with you, I don't know. Um, I don't want to just jump on like the public land bandwagon. Um, I, you know, there's plenty of guys out there doing that and they're doing a great job doing that. Um, you know, I, I would like to challenge myself in that arena to a certain extent, but I don't want to just be known as the public land guy that I've just given up suburban and now I just do public. Like that's not what I'm looking for here. What I'm, I think what I'm looking for is I want to get back to what I enjoy most about hunting. The suburbs can be extremely stressful um, as far as hunting goes. It's you're dealing with, you know, sometimes very large deer. You're pet, you're pursuing a particular animal. Um, there's a lot of other hunters out there, which is great. But when you're invested all in one deer, like it can all be done tomorrow. Um, and then there's also small property lines. You're dealing with other people like other residents, people that live in the area, such and such and such. And it just is an ingredient for a lot of stress. So 
I'm never going to give up the urban side. It's it's what I grew up doing. It's the style that I love. I still love it to death. Um, I think I just want to get back to more like carefree, just the love of hunting. <clears throat> and that's why I went to my buddy's farm where I killed my first deer when I was, you know, 14, 15 years old. Uh, I enjoyed that, like deeply, deeply enjoyed that. Uh, I've been hunting at home for the last week for a deer that I've got three years of history with at a place I've I've had permission at for like seven or eight years. And it has been amazing to hunt a place that I've got a bunch of memories and just to be home. Um, I'm actually about to, the wind is bad for the next three days. I'm actually making a run to a different state, another spot that I've had for five or six years. And I've got some amazing memories at that place. So like, I'm excited to still do the suburban stuff, but I think what I'm looking at is the next challenge and how to accent our channel uh, in broader ways. So I do want to challenge myself on the public stuff. I am interested in trying to find a lease out there in whichever state um, and maybe get into the land management side, take take an effort at, at doing some land management stuff. Um, also, like, I mean, you know, just kind of work on our resources too. Like uh, Lee and Tiffany invited us to their farm in Illinois. And I think it's, I think it's over a thousand acres. It's, I think it's for sure over a thousand acres. Um, and so like opening or accepting an invite like that to just go to experience something different. Um, I guess I'm sort of like digesting my thoughts and emotions and, and sort of going through a, uh, slightly of a shifting process in a sense. And I genuinely want to hear from you guys, like what would y'all enjoy seeing out of us going forward? Um, and if your feed, if the feedback is like, keep doing the suburban thing, like Give us your honest and genuine feedback. I take it all to heart. Um, but at the end of the day, I am going to go where my heart and my gut lead me. Um, but I do look at all of you guys um, as friends, and I, I, I just genuinely appreciate all of our viewers and listeners um, deeply. I wish I could literally sit down with all of y'all and have a beer. Uh, that's not the reality, and that's there's just – it's not possible, but I do – deep down wish I had the time to be able to sit down with each of individual one of you listening and watching right now and have a beer and just get to know each other. Um, but that being said, like, that's why I appreciate y'all's, y'all's commentary and y'all's feedback. And I, and again, I take it to heart on where to go from here. So please leave us some comments, um, as I'm kind of in this place of like what to do next. Um, I definitely want to challenge myself. Uh, that, that is what I love the most about hunting is the challenge. Um, I would not care about it at all if the challenge was not there so i'm looking for that next challenge please give us some of your thoughts um, this is good this is the actual closing to the kimbo story i just wanted to make sure that i fully unpacked everything um and did not you know leave things left unsaid just for the sake of like the respect and love i had for that animal and pursuing that animal so appreciate you guys listening i hope this wasn't too long-winded the video should be coming out around Thanksgiving. Um, again, it's been a year's worth of footage and it takes a long time to tell these stories. So appreciate y'all's patience. The next podcast coming out is going to be with Bill Jordan where he tells us two, he tells us how Realtree even began, which is a really cool story. And then he tells us two of the most gripping whitetail stories that I've ever heard of two 200 inch deer, 200 inch deer uh, that he missed in the same season. So that's the next one coming. Y'all check it out. Thank y'all for watching and listening.